Good morning. Today we are going to discuss about Forgetting by Robert Lind. Now before we move into the text, we'll have a quick look at the author. Uh, Robert Lind was born in Belfast in Ireland in 20th, on the 20th of April 1879. He was educated at the Royal Belfast Academic Institution and later in Queen's College Belfast where he studied classics and he graduated in 1899. He was greatly interested in politics and he founded the Belfast Socialist Society. Initially, he started uh, working as a journalist and he worked with the Belfast Daily, which was called the Northern Whig. In 1909, he went to Manchester and then London, where he worked as a freelance journalist. Later, he started working with the Daily News, where from 1912 to 1947, he was the literary editor. Uh, and after that, he joined New Statesman, where he published a weekly essay under the pseudonym YY. He was so much a part of the Irish literary revival, and he published many books, many uh, collections of essays and poems during his lifetime. Uh, he published almost 30 books during his lifetime. Many of them were selections of essays he wrote for different newspapers and magazines. Now these uh, ones which are lifted here are some of the works he published during his lifetime, which include The Money Box, The Orange Tree, Rain Rain, Go to Spain, Why Why, an anthology of essays, The Cockle Shell, Both Sides of the Road, I Tremble to Think. All these uh, are his works which were published in various newspapers and periodicals, which he put together in the form of books, collections of essays and poetry. Um, now, before we move into the story, into the uh, essay, Forgetting, uh, one, another essay comes to my mind, which he calls Un-English. That is the title of the essay, Un-English. Now, this essay is very interesting because he, uh, very lightly points at certain uh, English traits which they categorize as too good and some English traits which they categorize as too bad and which they call un-English, some behavioral patterns which they call un-English. Now he has written that essay also in a narrative style and uh, the, the storyline goes like this. Uh, this this uh, essay is about two Dutch seamen who went ashore uh, and uh, they got into a fight because of some issues in the ship. They got into a fight with some of the locals uh, in the dance hall and uh, they were arrested and charged with disorderly behavior. And Lind writes that their disorderly behavior included not just fighting but also biting. Uh, so the next morning the captain of the Dutch ship appeared in court to plead for these people and uh, uh, the magistrate who listens to their case comes to a conclusion that it was very un-English to go around fighting people. Whereupon the captain replied, it is very un-Dutch to your worship. And that, says Robert Lent, is one of the great retorts of history. So uh, when we look at Lent's essays, when we look at Lin's uh, writings, we understand that nothing is trivial for him. He takes even the most uh, silliest of matters and creates essays, creates a thought out of that trivial aspect of life. Now we'll move into the, uh, the text. We'll take a glimpse into the text. Robert Lin begins the essay forgetting uh, by saying that it is not exactly forgetting, he, he would like to call it another name, he calls it absent-mindedness. And uh, he begins the essay saying that uh, the list of lost articles uh, which were uh, written on in the London um, railway station has amused him. Because he says that he has often wondered at the efficiency of human memory. He says people can remember 
difficult telephone numbers, they can remember addresses, they can remember appointments, you know, they can remember um, the names of actor, actors, actresses, or the sportsmen. They can even uh, remember how to wear uh, their formal dress. They can even remember what weather it was last year, this time. You know, so uh, if the human memory is so efficient that um, it is quite ironic how people forget silliest of matters. And then he moves on to say, uh, talk about, he moves on to talk about forgetfulness with regard to medicines. He says that it's only a methodical man, a person who is so, uh, so um, focused on his doings, who, it's only a methodical man who takes medicines as prescribed. He says that medicine is usually forgotten by people because uh, people have an antipathy to pills. People feel that, okay, it is something which is coming into the body to harm them. So it is because of that reason that uh, they usually forget medicines. And he says that this idea of cure all medicine, that is a single tablet for any disease, delights him. Because uh, even if he forgets to take one medicine, he can have the cure all medicine and substitute for that. And he concludes that paragraph with a statement, chemists make their fortune out of medicines people forget to take. So uh, he says that forgetfulness has actually benefited the chemists. Forgetfulness has actually created a lot of profit for the chemists because uh, people, because it is a medicine, they always buy a new one even if they don't have one with them. He moves on to say the most common uh, aspect of forgetfulness that is with regard to posting letters. He says that uh, anyone who asks another person to post a letter is a poor judge of character because it is very normal, it is very uh, human to forget to post a letter. He recounts, uh, he recalls an incident when uh, someone had given him a letter to post, which he kept in his pocket to keep it safe. He passed many uh, post boxes, but forgot to post the letter. And then finally, when the person asked him, he had to produce the evidence of guilt, the, 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 the letter which he forgot to post. He had to give, uh, produce that evidence, he says. So, Forgetfulness is very usual, very common uh, with regard to posting letters. Uh, he says that he comes to public transport after that. And he says that in trains and public transport, uh, like buses, uh, most of the items which are lost include books, walking sticks, umbrella, footballs, cricket bats, fishing rods, etc. And he comes to a conclusion from uh, what he had assumed from the list of London Railway, list that was published in London Railway Station. He comes to an assumption that it's usually the young people who are more forgetful in nature than the adults. And he very specifically points to sportsmen and anglers. Uh, he says that uh, sportsmen, he calls sportsmen the citizens of dreamland because they are full of imagination and the memory of games. So once they get into the train, they completely forget about what they have in hand. They are so full of imagination, they are so full of the memories of their games that they forget uh, what they have, they lose things in that way. He calls them citizens of the dreamland. He calls anglers, the fishing men, as the most imaginative of all people because they invent magnificent lies about the glorious deeds of fishing that they have done on that day. So this, uh, in the process of inventing this lie, in the process of being imaginative, it is natural that the angler forgets his fishing rod in a train or a public transportation. I caught Robert Lind who says, absent-mindedness of this kind seems to me all but a virtue. The absent-minded man is often a man who is making the best of life, therefore has no time to remember the mediocre, the ordinary. So this is the point where he starts defending forgetfulness. He starts 
saying in the side of forgetfulness. He says that absent-mindedness is actually not a big problem. It is not a, a vice to be condemned. He says it's a virtue because absent-minded people are the ones who make the best out of everything. It is only because their mind is so involved with things around them that they forget the mediocre, the ordinary things which they carry with them. Uh, and he continues to defend forgetfulness and he's, he says, the men with fallible memories have sometimes tried to make a case for their superiority. A man, they say, who is a perfect remembering machine is seldom a man of the first intelligence. So that's the point of his defense. He says that whoever has memory troubles, whoever has troubles with absent-mindedness, uh, with forgetfulness, uh, is actually a man of the first intelligence, is actually a man of great imagination and exceptional powers. Uh, and then he moves on to talk about the writers and composers of music who have exceptional powers of memory. And uh, he says that people who deal with literature, people who deal with art, seem to have more memory than the others. He says that the poets are, have better memories than stockbrokers. And uh, because whatever they write, whatever they produce, the art that they produce, half of it is part of memory. If you recall uh, Wordsworth's definition of poetry, he says poetry is a spontaneous outflow of powerful feelings and emotions recollected in tranquility. So the feelings that uh, are evoked in a poet when uh, he witnesses, when he has uh, an object of inspiration, uh, those feelings are, are later recalled to be transformed into poetry. So he says that poets, uh, composers, writers, they have better memories than the other people, than stockbrokers, yes. And he moves on to say statesmen or politicians, they have really bad memories. And he gives an example, uh, like if you ask two statesmen to recall a same incident, they would end up giving inaccurate details. Two of them will have two different setting, two different plot running for the same incident. So that's how he defends forgetfulness. He says that people who forget or people who are not uh, perfect remember rememberers, you know, they are uh, actually people of first intelligence. And then he concludes the uh, essay using uh, an instance, uh, using an example to say that the extreme side of forgetfulness becomes eccentricity. Uh, he talks about this man who agrees to take care of the child and his wife is out. Uh, he takes the baby out uh, with him in a perambulator and on the way he sees a bar, gets into the bar, completely forgets about the baby that in the perambulator that is kept outside the uh, bar. He gets drunk and that's the time when his wife comes and sees the baby on the rod. So wife gets so scared, uh, wife gets so irritated, she takes the baby home and thinks of teaching him a lesson. She, she thinks that the, this man would come back home and, um, and uh, would be all tensed about losing the baby. But what happened actually was that he completely forgot about the baby and he came back home very happy and the first thing, instead of asking for the baby, he asks his wife is uh, whether the lunch was ready. So uh, that is the extreme form of forgetfulness. He calls it eccentric. And then he moves on. Uh, he concludes the uh, essay I, uh, by saying the following words. How many men below the, ra below the rank of a philosopher would be capable of such absent-minded as this? Most of us, I fear, are born with prosaically efficient memories. If it were not so, the institution of family could not survive in any great modern city. So he says that forgetfulness can be affordable in certain situations, but not always. For a family to run smoothly, for any, any social institution to run smoothly, we need to have at least uh, prosaically efficient memories, uh, not the eccentric form of memory. He says that only a philosopher would
be able to afford absent-mindedness, not any other ordinary man. That's how he concludes the essay. Now to move into the literary devices that you find in this essay. Uh, first of all, the theme. The theme of this essay is very clearly forgetfulness of absent-mindedness. The author uses a lot of incidents from his day, uh, daily life. Uh, he uses imaginative instances from uh, others' lives and he, move, and he uh, tries to defend uh, forgetfulness or absent-mindedness. At the same time, he keeps himself in a safe position, saying that uh, complete forgetfulness becomes eccentric in nature. So the theme uh, deals entirely with forgetfulness. The theme is forgetfulness. The style of uh, writing is narrative. As you have read the essay, you would have understood that he narrates incidents to prove the point. He brings evidences in the form of stories to prove the point. So uh, his style becomes basically narrative in nature, and it is a lucid style. It is a simple style which can be understood by any anyone around. The tone is humorous. He uh, brings in a lot of uh, humorous incidents, starting with the case of posting letters, and then his uh, views, his uh, views about sportsmen and anglers, uh, and then towards the end, how forgetfulness, extreme form of forgetfulness, could be eccentric. You know, he employs humor as a technique throughout. That is why it becomes interesting for the reader to continue reading um, his works. It is also, um, this text can also be looked at as a light satire. It is not a sh sharp or a harsh satire uh, at any one pointedly, but this is a light satire and it exposes the general trend of forgetting. And uh, he uh, uses situational irony to show how uh, people tend to forget the important yet trivial matters. Um, the sportsman, cannot imagine the next day's sport with, without a, um, you know, a, a cricket bat or a, a football. So it is important, but at the same time trivial when it, when it uh, is looked at from, their, um, from the thought processes that are running in their mind. Uh, he employs the first person point of view because there is a lot of use of the I pronoun. Uh, and then later he moves on, uh, you know, he also becomes an omniscient kind of narrator when he narrates the story of the man taking the baby in the parabolator. Um, there are a lot of visual images used in the, in the essay, like that of posting letters, how, how he forgets posting letters of the sportsmen who are, you know, imaginative of, uh, you know, uh, the mem imaginative of their next day's plays and who are who delve in their memories of games, and the anglers who invent magnificent lies to glorify themselves. You know, he presents a lot of visual images in the forms of stories, and there are allusions to Coleridge and Socrates. Uh, Socrates, the philosopher, he uses the names of Socrates and Coleridge, the romantic poet. He uses the names to say that. Uh, they have quite good memories and they are uh, better off in terms of memories than statesmen and, um, and the stockbrokers. Now coming to the prose style of Robert Lind. Uh, as we said earlier, there is no subject which he considers too trivial or too insignificant for his consideration. Uh, if you look at the collection of his essays, you'll understand that he has written about uh, spies in one essay, S-P-I-E-S, spies in one essay. He has written about beds, B-E-A-R-D-S, beds in another essay. So uh, anything that he finds interesting becomes the point of conversation for him. And he uses this reflective form of writing. Uh, it is not simply a matter of fact kind of narration that he does, but he reflects, uh, he brings into uh, the portals of the essay his own uh, understandings. 
and his own assumptions about that particular topic. He uses gentle humor, he uses satire, and as A.C. Ward uh, brilliantly says that he is a skilled phrase maker. He can describe a cup final with his eye on many things beside the game or everything uh, except the games. So he uh, is so skilled at phrase making, uh, making phrases which uh, never even come to the mind of the reader. Uh, one example A.C. Ward says about his phrase making ability is uh, from this essay, Virtue. Uh, I quote, there is great danger of the revival of virtue in this country. There are, I know, two kinds of virtue, and one of them is a vice. So uh, how he plays with the name virtue and how uh, he calls vice again as another virtue. So uh, that's the style, that's the uh, amazing uh, writing style of Robert Lind. He has continued to um, amuse people over the years and even after his death there are many uh, essays who uh, look back to him and say that uh, and say that okay, there is no greater essayist uh, after Lind uh, or even after Charles Lamb. So that's the uh, heights of Robert Lind's um, acceptance of uh, essays and how he is popular among the people. Thank you.